things of ourselves as the true church should we have dialogue with other Christians my answer is twofold I would say first we should be eager to share as grace not by our own merit to view we do begin to learn more about our own orthodox faith but I would go further than that at the last supper some chairs here please come at the last supper Jesus prayed for his disciples and what he prayed for above all was unity may they all be one he said as you father are in me and I in you so also may they be one in us I in you and they in me may they all be perfectly one now this is a crucial moment in the life of Christ just a few hours before he is going to be betrayed and taken to his death and what is uppermost in his mind at this point it is exactly that his disciples should be one that is what he prays for so if we engage in dialogue it is out of obedience to Christ we should seek all possible ways of achieving unity with separated Christians out of obedience to our Lord but there's another general point that I would add here half a century ago a highly interesting book was written on the Christian understanding of the human person still well worth reading although much neglected by a Scottish philosopher John McMurray called Persons in Relation and his main theme was precisely that personhood is relational as persons we are what we are only in relation to other persons no one isolated cut off from others turned inward is truly a person in the early church there was a phrase unus Christianus nullus Christianus one Christian means no Christian you can only be a Christian with other Christians and one could extend that by saying una persona nulla persona one person, no person as McMurray puts it the self exists only in dynamic relation with the other the self is constituted by its relationship to the other it has its being in its relationship and he goes on to say that there is no true person unless there are at least two persons in dialogue with one another to be human is to be dialogic and McMurray sums this up by saying I need you in order to be myself and I think we could apply that to church communities if as church communities we are turned inward isolated from the others we do not truly fulfill our vocation as human beings who are dialogic animals we need to say to the other Christians I need you in order to be myself so I would in this way see dialogue as obedience to the will of Christ but also as expressing something essential to our personhood we are to relate to one another 
Perhaps some of us are suffering from ecumenical fatigue. We feel that we hear far too much about Christian unity. But let us recall the wise words of a great Orthodox pioneer in the work for you, Christian unity, Father George Florovsky. And he says, the highest and most promising ecumenical virtue is patience. Though I would add, we need an impatient patience. Come along in. I think we can bring a few more chairs here. So, with those introductory remarks in mind, let's now look at specific dialogues in which we Orthodox are engaged. Now, the most important dialogue, in my view, is neither a dialogue with the Roman Catholics, nor that with the Anglicans but our dialogue with the Oriental Orthodox. That means the Copts, the Ethiopians, the Armenians, the Syrian Orthodox. And here the division goes right back to the 5th and 6th century. In the 1960s, the Oriental Orthodox and the we might call ourselves Byzantine Orthodox Greeks, Russians, Romanians, Serbians Bulgarians and so on they began to have discussions and they were mainly discussing the person of Christ because the Oriental Orthodox often called Monophysites say that Christ has one nature and we, following the Council of Chalcedon, say that he has two natures. As a result of these discussions, it was agreed by the delegates on the two sides that this was really a linguistic point, that the two sides are using the word nature, physis, in different ways. And the two sides the <clears throat> Oriental and the Byzantine Orthodox were able to agree that Christ is fully and completely God and fully and completely human and yet he is one person and not two and on the basis of this agreement in 1989 the two sides, the delegates on both sides said as two families of Orthodox churches long out of communion with each other we now pray and trust to God to restore that communion on the basis of the apostolic faith of the undivided church of the first centuries which we confess in our common creed and that's the Nicene Creed that we use every Sunday in the Divine Liturgy so they thought sufficient agreement had been reached to restore communion. Well, this is our aim in our different discussions, to restore sacramental communion with each other. Now that was said 21 years ago, and since then nothing much has happened. There's a certain inertia, and this resolution by the delegates 
has not in fact been carried into effect by the churches on both sides part of the difficulty has been that one of the moving spirits behind the reunion between the Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox was the Emperor Haile Selassie Christian emperors are of great value but unfortunately with the revolution in Ethiopia uh, he died as a martyr and um, his inspiration has not therefore been present to press things forward also there are people who, on both sides who feel that this is premature there are people among the non-Chalcedonian Christians, the Oriental Christians who are not in favour of union who think that we are Nestorians and there are people, for example, in the University of Athens and on Mount Athos who feel that the Oriental Orthodox are monophysites and are heretics so there are groups on both sides who have reservations and this is rather important a group of delegates may discuss together and come to quite a favourable opinion but their findings have to be received by the whole body of the church on either side and this reception can take time and be quite difficult but I hope that there will be in my lifetime progress here in this dialogue and the communion can be restored I used to hope it would be restored by the year 2000 now I will say 2020 if I'm still around then so let's turn now to my main theme which is the Catholics and the Anglicans the Catholic Orthodox dialogue started in 1980 on the island of Patmos the, uh, in the monastery of which I am a member though I wasn't there at the time and just to show you that not everybody is in favour of dialogue as the delegates were having a service in the monastery church a group of the monks went up onto the roof of the monastery hauled down the flag showing the Byzantine double-headed eagle which the monastery flies and they replaced it with a black flag saying orthodoxy or death <laughs> the delegates below were not amused <laughs> Now, in the 1980s, uh, um, the Catholic Orthodox Dialogue produced some good statements on the Trinity, the Church as the Eucharistic community, the nature of the priesthood. Then they got into the question of the Uniates, that's to say those Eastern Christians who are in communion with Rome with the fall of communism the different Uniate churches were restored in Ukraine and in Romania they had already been restored at an earlier date in Czechoslovakia and this restoration resulted in a lot of conflict on the local level um, and largely because of this the Orthodox Catholic dialogue dug itself a bit into the sand but in 2006 we got started again in Belgrade now it was very interesting that we were invited to be guests of the Serbian church those of you whose memories extend to the Second World War will recall that in